John takes us to the book of Philippians. Book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 13. Can you please also have your children open their Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 4, and verse 13. Over there. Yes. Okay. It says there, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. The Lord has a special blessing to his word. It's an ominous thing when everybody gets up to leave. And, uh, the message that the Lord gave to me today to give to you, I want to uh, let you know, understand that it may not be comfortable. And we don't have to take it personally. I'm not pointing at any fingers at anybody. I'm just simply taking what the Lord told me to say. Right. And um, I want you to uh, know that God loves you all very much, every one of you. And hopefully you will see that in, in the end when right we reach the end here. Uh, I would like the Lord to ask him to come and again to, to help me through this. Heavenly Father, uh, this message for you, us today is uncomfortable for many, and since some of us may be squirming in our seats, because we see in it in each one of these cases, Lord, uh, ourselves, and uh, sometimes we cross many of these different cases, Lord, and we ask you, Lord, that you uh, help us to see in them the flaws that we have and what we need to be ready for your kingdom when it comes. And to fulfill the purpose that you have us for to hear it, to help us to set aside our selfish ideas and our view of the world and start to see things as you see them. Send your Holy Spirit to fill us with that love, the love of your commandments, the love of your law, the love, of the law of love. Father God, please be with us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The first thing I'd like to ask you is uh, what do Moses? Here, is that working now? There we go. What do Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jonah have in common? Can you think what that is? Moses, Isaac, Abraham, and Jonah. What do they have in common? They all were asked to do something they didn't want to do, right? Uh, sometimes we're asked to do things we don't want to do either. Uh, Moses was asked to go talk to the Pharaoh, and what did he do? He said, me? No, I'm slow of speech. No, I can't get somebody else to do it. You can't do it. In fact, in, when you read it in Exodus where it talks about that, God got a little bit upset with him. And uh, Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son. Why do you think he felt? Do you think he wanted to do that? And Isaac eventually figured out what was going on. How do you think he felt? Do you think he wanted to step there and receive the knife? Uh, what would you do in those cases? Jonah. He was so against what God wanted him to do, he ran the other way. And he ended up in the belly of a whale. You want to end up in the belly of a whale? I don't know either. So... In the end, he said, what good day. even at the end, he said, I don't want to talk to those people, those no good for nothing. They're looking at all the trouble they called it. They deserve what they're going to get. That was his attitude. What's our attitude? Jesus often made his point through the parables and stories that he told. And perhaps right now would be a good time to hear a parable. And this is the parable we have for you this morning. And once was a man who had a very large farm, a large farm enterprise, and he had many servants. And the servants that worked for him, he loved very much. And he was kind, and he was an excellent judge of potential and, um, what's the word, hidden talent. He knew his business better than anyone else, 
and he knew it better than anyone else could, ever could. And, and he knew what it took to make his enterprise successful, even in hard times. The master absolutely loved everyone that worked for him, and he was one of those people who just never knew anyone he didn't like. He shared everything fairly with all his servants, and saw to it that not one of the servants lacked for anything they needed. And everyone that worked for him ate, at, ate with him at his table. And everyone shared equally in all the provision. The master had a heart wrenching desire to expand his enterprise and to gather as many people into his corporation as he possibly could so that he could see to their needs, their life needs. The character and talents of his servants varied widely. And as you might imagine they would. However, he found that if he had to classify his servants, those characters all fell into six unique groupings. The first group would number only a few people. These were servants that loved the master dearly and would do anything he asked and without question. The master didn't always tell these servants what he had in mind for them to do, but they hardly had faith that he knew what he was doing, sort of like what Abraham did. These servants never complained and often took on tasks beyond their share of the load. And pretty understandable, isn't it, that there were so few of them. The second group were numbered quite a bit larger, but not nearly as big as the balance of the rest of all put together of everyone else. These servants were similar to the first group in their willingness to do anything the master asked them to do. They too were diligent in service. And uh, they loved and had faith in their master like the first group did. But these servants also knew how very you know, they also knew how very much the Lord loved them or their master loved them. However, they laid in, and held inside their hearts a bitterness towards the other servants who wouldn't pull their share of the load. And sometimes these servants would complain. And when they complained to the slacker servants, the slackers would simply ignore them. And when they complained to the master, the master would always say this. He would tell them that he loved them dearly. But they needed to see what the slacker servants could be and not what they were. The master reminded them that they once were sluggers themselves, but they, they have matured into fine men and women. The master reminded them that they needed to perfect the love by forgiving those who did wrongly, and to try to help the sluggers see what they needed and required to have success. It was these first and second groups that the master found his perfect friends. The third group was a fair number as well. Like the first two groups, they believed the master knew what he was doing, and they were diligent in their service as well. However, they felt no particular love for the master. They appreciated the fact that the master was kind and fair, but it led to no particular attitude of allegiance or commitment to him. They never volunteered for anything, but when they were asked to do something, they responded inwardly reluctant but outwardly affirmative. These servants would leave the master high and dry if they perceived a better deal somewhere else down the road. The reason they stayed was that they didn't see any better deal in the offing, so that's why they stayed on. These servants were obedient to execute, execute the orders, but were frequently deviated from the instruction given by the master to execute the responsibility their own way, which usually led to compromised results. The fourth group were the largest single group, bigger than all the rest combined. Though they professed to be committed to the Master, they never loved nor appreciated the Master for his kindness. Unlike the first three groups, they're not particularly convinced that the Master knew what he was doing, and often believe that they had a better idea for the way to handle things. And usually in their own way, and they had a better idea of how to use their time. They rarely or never volunteered to do anything. And when asked to do something inwardly, they miserly weighed out their willingness uh, to assess what, uh, what was chosen for them to do. And